Uh, good morning, everybody. Before I get started, I want to uh, remind you that you're doing important work here and to thank you uh, for what you do. Uh, I appreciate it, and, and the rest of us appreciate it as well. So to begin, let's orient ourselves. So why are we computing? Why, why are you running climate models? Why are we running you know, models of particle accelerators? It's to gain insight. Uh, it's, not, it's not just numbers, although if you're one of those numerical analysis people that likes to compute digits of pi, maybe it is numbers, but uh, for the rest of us, it's, it's about insight. So if you're time constrained today and you only have 30 seconds to hang out in this talk before you have to go uh, to another meeting, here's the main message. So what's, what's in situ processing all about? Well, so the idea is to do as much visualization or data analysis while data is still a memory. Uh, wh why bother with this? Well, the problem is that there's, uh, uh, HPC platforms are constrained in their ability to write data to persistent storage for subsequent analysis. Um, there's a rich history of work going back into the 1960s. There's a bunch of work underway now, uh, R&D in this space, and some pretty good software tools that you can use to solve this problem. Uh, there's performance gains that you can uh, realize by pursuing this approach. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some applications to science problems. OK, so that's, that's the talk. Um, so I want to give a uh, shout out to John here. So John, John has a difficult job. And I'm going to explain what John's job is like to you. So uh, you, the scientist, you're sitting in your office and you think up some great new thing. It's like, you know, I got this great idea for this new thing. And this person does, you know, drug design. And so she comes up with this model for uh, some 3D drug. And she wants to understand how well it does uh, binding. Uh, to proteins. So this is a complicated, this is one of these gnarly optimization problems, gnarly op, uh, permutations where, in your, where you're in a continuous space, not a discrete space. This is known as MP-hard in computer science literature. So she's got this great idea. But she needs to go talk to JC down the hall to get some help in, in looking at this data. So uh, JC, um, I'm using Nelson Max as a proxy for JC. Nelson Max is a uh, pioneer in the field of computer graphics and in, in my field. So um, Nelson, JC says, we, we have these great tools for looking at 3D data uh, and you know, having human in the loop optimization and that sort of thing. Oh, what format's your data in, by the way? And the scientist goes, data format, what's that? I think it's binary data written out by the simulation, maybe an IEEE floating point format, and there's about one terabyte per time step, and I have thousands of time steps, and you know, but I can't write it out because it takes so darn long. And then JC, you, you, we all recognize this expression, right? We're like, oh my, just great. Now, now I gotta help my colleague engineer an IO solution before I can even do my job, which is to do data analysis. Well, guess what? The problem gets worse because if you do the math, you know, a terabyte per time step, 5,000 time steps, uh, that's, that's five petabytes. And if, and if you get 500 gigabytes a second off of one of these machines, that's 10,000 hours, which if you do the math, that's like, you know, over a year just to do I.O. of this problem size, right? So this is intractable. It's, you, can't, you can't, this is not a, a, a viable approach. And so uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And you know, people like John come to save the day. John, John ends up having to engineer I.O. solutions for science. I mean, this is, this is life. This is life. OK, so let me drill a little bit into um, the problem here. So there's not enough I.O. capacity in these machines. And even, even if there was, there's not enough storage. And so if you can't save it and you can't analyze it, you lose science, you know, plain and simple. Um, there's an energy issue. Uh, it takes a lot of power to write a byte of data out to disk. And you know, think about the science you could do if you had access to full spatiotemporal resolution data. That would be great. So there's this great uh, picture. I'm going to tell a story here about um, five orders of magnitude difference between uh, bandwidth uh, inside the machine all the way out to uh, the disk to, to drive this point home. So, uh, and I'm, I'm using um, a, a Titan, the Titan system at Oak Ridge, which is a few years old at this point, but the uh, point remains. I'll, I'll bring this forward into the future in just a second. So, 
um, register to register bandwidth, uh, bisection bandwidth across the machine is 125 petabytes a second. All right, that's pretty good. You can do a lot with that. But then by the time you actually write stuff out to DRAM on the node, you're down to, you, you've lost a, a, a couple of orders of magnitude. You're down to four and a half petabytes a second. And then um, the next, sorry, the animation here is kind of goofy. Then going from uh, node memory out to the, the node interconnect fabric, the, the connections between all the nodes, right? You've lost another two orders of magnitude uh, bandwidth going from four and a half petabytes a second down to uh, 24 terabytes a second. And then going out to the, uh, the file system, um, you know, you're losing another order of magnitude bandwidth. So you're going from 24 terabytes a second down to about a terabyte. A second, and this is on a good day. This is with a tailwind. This is assume everything works right. Five orders of magnitude. Okay, so the title. Whoops. The title of this talk is, you know, do you really want to analyze one out of every hundred thousand data values? You thought it was a joke. I'm not joking. This is serious business. If you don't do something about this, that's all you got to work with. Okay, so uh, Bethel, you say, really. You know, that, this slide's a few years old. Let me, you, you, you're crazy. You know, th things have changed. But, you know, actually they haven't. So um, Titan, Titan is the old machine, Summit's the new machine at Oak Ridge. And I know this is a um, number dense table, but let me draw your attention to a couple of things here. So the first one, just looking at uh, application overall performance, they expect, you know, five to ten times uh, on Summit, they'll get five to ten times the application performance on Titan. So that means five to ten times more computations, more flops. But, uh, you know, down here on the file system, they're going to, you know, increase the total disk storage by about a factor of four. But guess what? The bandwidth out to the uh, file system remains the same. So guess what? The problem's worse. It's not one out of every hundred thousand. It's one out of every million. Um, so this is uh, pretty bad. But then you say, gosh, Bethel, you know, that's from 2017, and those are projected spe specs, but what about the actual machine that's on the floor now? Ah, that's a good question. So um, it gets worse. OK, so I, I was looking at the, the Summit web page a couple of days ago, and so they have more no nodes, you know, 4,600 4, rather than 3,400, um, you know, the same uh, InfiniBand interconnect. They actually did better with the file system I.O., so two and a half terabytes a second. So that's pretty good. Uh, and uh, a quarter exabyte of storage, which is, which is pretty good. Um, but it still didn't, you know, we're still orders of magnitude apart. They haven't really solved the problem. Um, they've given the illusion that the problem's being solved, but it's not. OK, so you can't read this at all, so I'm not going to worry about it. If, if you could read this, if you had your magnifying glass and could read this, you would see the same story that I've been telling you across all these systems. So over on the left are systems from a few years ago, and then over on the right are uh, more updated versions of these systems at the three different HPC centers and DOE, and, and it's the same story. There's you know, uh, a, a dearth of I.O. OK, so um, there's the summit uh, data again. So OK, so th think for a second. You can save, what, what kind of science is going to result if you're analyzing one out of every 100,000 data points? So I, I, I made up this contrived example. You can laugh at me. I'll show you a real example later. This one's contrived, but it makes the point. And it should be one that you all, that, that should strike a, a nerve with you, I hope. OK, so here we have this chart I pulled off of Wikipedia. It shows global average temperature with five-year smoothing. So we've all seen this. Uh, wh what happens if you take a couple of samples out of this and then do some analysis? You get a different trend. OK, this is what happens. Uh, and this is a stupid example, but it makes the point. Um, and the same thing happens across all aspects of science. This is serious business. OK, so some definitions. What's in situ data analysis in this? So there's two broad use models. One is, <clears throat> excuse me, one is called post hoc. So you write everything out to disk, and then you read it in later, and you analyze it. OK, uh, you analyze it at your leisure. Uh, the other, which I'm using this umbrella term in situ processing, it means that you process all this data while it's in place. So this is what Latin. Uh, 
the, the uh, Latin word in situ means. It means in place. So you're operating on it uh, in place. So there's a bunch of different flavors of in situ. And if you've been exposed to this stuff, you've heard in situ, in translate, lo loosely coupled, tightly coupled, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter. We'll use the word in situ to refer to, to all of them um, without, without loss of meaning. So here's an example. Um, I'm going to discriminate between in situ and in transit. So here, this diagram shows a four-socket system, four-socket node, and each socket has four cores on it. And I'm color, I'm, you know, the, the simulation cores are colored in this brick color, and the analysis cores are colored in blue. And so on, in the socket, data doesn't have to move. So the analysis core can access the same DRAM that the simulation's uh, using. Does that, does that make sense? OK. Now, in the case of in transit, we have the same uh, four uh, socket system, but all of the all of the data is moving from each of these sockets over to the DRAM of this other socket uh, for analysis. So in this case, data has to move. In this case, no data movement is required. This is an important thing to keep in mind. Over here, data has to move. So which one's better? Well, the answer is it depends, and I really don't have a chance to get into that in this talk, but trust me, there's some configurations in which um, this one actually yields a lower time to solution, lower cost uh, for, for some problems. Not all of them, but for some problems. So again, just um, uh, suspend your uh, knowledge of you know, all of these different variations of the words in situ, in transit, co-processing, et cetera. We're just going to say in situ to refer to all of these things. OK, so let me quickly cover some uh, previous work in this space. Um, so this, uh, yeah, there's, there's been a bunch of work here, and I've given a version of this talk a couple of different places. Uh, some, of, some of the people in the audience have done a lot of this previous work, and you know how it is. If you don't mention your friend's work, they get mad at you, and so please don't get mad. So. Okay, so um, ancient history. Let's see, this is supposedly a movie. No, uh, that's, it goes somewhere else. So um, from 1964. 1964, this is pretty cool. Um, so uh, Edwin Sajak did this movie, and he was working at Bell Labs. And if I were to play this, what you would see is this planet orbiting, and this is a satellite, and it moves around. And the idea is to keep the satellite oriented at the Earth, right? It's pretty cool. And um, in this example, uh, you know, he did the computation. He did this cali calligraphic display. Calligraphic display, does anybody know what that is? No. So this is ancient history from the graphics world. Um, your, your monitor on your desk, it's a raster scan thing, lots of little pixels. Uh, back in the day, right, uh, we used calligraphic displays, and, and you draw strokes, like, like calligraphy, right? And so this is a calligraphic display. All of these are strokes. So uh, you, know, you did a calligraphic, uh, did the computation of the orientation of the, of the satellite, the planet. Uh, he drew a picture. Uh, it's got a little clock there that shows the evolution of time, and went direct to film. So in this case, this is in situ because nothing ever hit the disk. Right? That's pretty cool. Um, so why did he do it? Well, it was standard practice for, the, for that era because disk storage was really expensive. Guess what? Some things never change. Uh, disk storage is still expensive. So this was standard practice a long time ago, you know, 50 years ago almost. OK, so um, more recently, um, the 1990s was the era, I call it the golden era of coprocessing. So this example shows a uh, multi-phase CFD um, code. Uh, it's actually an uh, oil reservoir uh, simulation. And so water is injected into the ground. It was actually used for environmental remediation to push gunk um, from a production well to, I'm sorry, from an injection well to production wells. And then what you could do is you could, um, with VR gear, actually you know, place the injection well. That was the optimization that was uh, to be done here. And so in this example, nothing ever went to disk. Right? There's a simulation running. There's a visualization piece running. There's you know, I.O. stuff happening in VR. Nothing ever hit the disk. Um, so this was pretty cool. And there's a bunch of examples of stuff you know, from this area. Uh, from this area. Um, there's stuff that was running on distributed memory machines, so back on the, on the connection machine, uh, 
two and five, right, believe it or not. Um, AVS, a bunch of us were using AVS back in the day. Uh, Cumulus was a project out of uh, Oak Ridge that um, solved a uh, gnarly distributed memory M to N problem. So that problem is if you have a simulation and an analysis tool, and the simulation's running M way parallel, and the consumer's running N way parallel, you have this data redistribution problem. And so these, these folks are working on that problem uh, back in the day. Uh, because of time, I'm going to skip over these design patterns. Um, so in computational steering, the idea is uh, you want to converge towards a solution quickly. And so there was a bunch of work that was done. Excuse me. Um, you know, this is, again, Nelson and, and some colleagues. Uh, we were doing this with uh, protein um, uh, shape optimization. OK, so think for a second. If you are doing in situ visualization analysis, all right, so you're running a simulation, you have it connect directly to some other chunk of code that does some sort of computation, you need to decide you know, what the parameters are for this other computation. So like if you're computing an ISO contour, you've got to decide what the ISO level is. Right? Well, what happens if you get it wrong? Well, you blew it. You have to go back and rerun the simulation. So this, that's, that's what this message is all about, right? If, if it's ISO contour, that's one parameter. What if it's 3D visualization? You have camera parameters. That's you know, eight or nine more parameters, uh, et cetera. And you can see this explosion of uh, you know, combinations of stuff. And you've got to get this stuff right before you run the simulation. All right? This is a problem. Wouldn't it be nice if you could combine the best of both worlds, namely doing exploratory visualization and analysis combined with you know, doing a bunch of this stuff um, in situ? Oh, and by the way, the issue with exploratory in situ visualization analysis you know, on the DOE machines, I don't know how it is for you all. You know, on the DOE machines, it's all batch, right? So you submit a batch job, and this thing, you know, my phone's going to go off at 2 in the morning, and I'm going to jump out of bed and go connect to it. And, and st No, I'm not. So this is, this, is, this is the issue that we face. So the, the workaround here is to compute something in situ that you can use in exploratory fashion later. So the idea of explorable extracts. And so the, um, you know, he, here, this example shows uh, the, the extract that's computed that you can explore later are these multi-resolution images of this object taken from different viewpoints. And so uh, you, you have this pile of images that you work with rather than a 3D data set. Uh, and then you can zoom in and you swap out lower res versions and swap in higher res versions. And you know, this, this idea has some uh, traction. Here I'm using images, but it could be something else. You could compute isocontours. You could take an isocontour and extract all the other field variables you know, within some epsilon of the surface. I mean, there's a lot that you can do with that. So uh, for example, here's you know, a bunch. So there's isocontours, images. You could do stuff with topological-based features, find uh, critical points, find saddle points in, in data sets, uh, and track those. So there's a ton of work in this space. People have been thinking about this for a long time. OK, so uh, shifting gears, I'm going to, th I think this is probably why you're here, is to learn about what's available. So um, there's a lot going on. So I tried to bucket these things up, and they seem to bucket into the following categories. So there's existing applications that have in situ APIs. So how many people here know what visit and pair of you are? Oh, good, a bunch of, bunch of hands went up. So parallel visualization analysis tools. And each of these has, so for the most part, you sit down and you launch it and you get a GUI and you sit there and point and click and you drive it that way. But both of these have in situ APIs for connecting to codes. Um, there are some tools that are actually in situ APIs that connect to stuff, right? And so there's a couple of projects here. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm the PI of this project. It's been around for about six years. Um, there are other projects that are basically I.O. libraries, parallel I.O. libraries that let you insert your code into the I.O. path and execute some computations on data as it moves through the I.O. path. You know, works pretty well. And then there's a, a new thing, um, cooperative multitasking, uh, this thing called Henson. I'm going to talk a little bit about Henson because you'll probably never hear about it anywhere else. Um, yes, Henson is named after uh, uh, Jim Henson and Muppets, and you'll see why. 
and my colleague, I tried to use the Oscar the Grouch picture because that's a good proxy for my colleague, but he didn't like that. So I, okay. So let me, uh, to, to get you warmed up a little bit for, um, you know, the information that's going to come as we talk about these packages, let's talk about design patterns for a second. So uh, this is it. It's really simple. Inside your code, you call a method to initialize the infrastructure. You um, hand it some data. Something happens. And then when you're done, you, you finalize. Um, and you, you might think, well, Wow, that's not that's not too complicated. That's not too bad. I can deal with that. You know, here's where something here's here's where stuff gets interesting. So when you hand data to this uh, external system, you know, it could be an entry point into this distributed workflow. I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, that can happen here. Okay, and you might think, gosh, you know, it seems like I've seen something like this before. Well, yeah, you have. You know, it's it's called POSIX IO, and we've been doing this for four decades, right? You open a file, you read or write a f stuff to it, and you close it. I mean. That design pattern is bulletproof. It works well. So, um, you know, again, here's a generic processing sequence. Inside your simulation, you initialize it, and then, you know, while you're not done, you compute some new simulation set, you advance variables. Uh, if you're doing I.O., you write a plot file, right? Uh, and then finally you finalize. Okay, so the detail, one of the details here is, you know, you don't do I.O. on every simulation step, right? Why not? Because it's expensive. OK, so what happens to this to add in situ? Well, actually, not too much. Um, you do an initialization step. Uh, you know, here, you do I.O. You could write plot file. If you're doing in situ, then you, you know, execute it. And then finally, uh, finalize. I mean, this, this is uh, not, not really rocket science, I hate to say. So let me talk briefly about um, some of these in situ infrastructures. So Paraview Catalyst. So this is a text-dense slide. Let me try and highlight a couple of key points. So on the simulation side, there's an initialization method, a coprocess method where you hand out data, and then a finalized method. Um, over here, uh, remember, Paraview is this complicated thing. It's got a lot of buttons and stuff. And so you've got to set up the view to begin with. You save, it, save that state as like a Python file or something. And then you, know, you, you have to load that Python file into Paraview and then start you know, dumping data into it. I mean, there's, uh, there's some stuff going on behind the curtain that I'm not going to get into, but that's basically how it works. Um, again, inside the simulation, you have to instrument the code to push, to, to talk to the uh, Catalyst API. So um, one, of the, one of the complaints over the years has been, gosh, the visits and the peer views are these big, monster, Godzilla-sized chunks of code. This is way too much. You know, it's, just, it's too big. And so what the people at Kitware did was they came up with this thing called um, uh, Catalyst Additions, right? And so what you can do is you can build this you know, stripped-down version of, of uh, peer view that, um, you know, depending on what you need. And so the, the full Monty is, you know, close to 100 megabytes, and this was, you know, 2016. And you can, you know, tear it all the way down to just a couple of megabytes if that's what you need. Okay, so that's Pairview Catalyst. So uh, switching gears, um, Visit, Visit has an API. The Visit application has an API called Libsyn. And so the idea is basically that you can connect to it with an external viewer. Um, you can connect to a simulation instrumented with Libsyn with an external viewer and, um, you know, do stuff with it. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, that's, that's what I just said. So you, you, can, you can tell Visit to produce data, data extracts, and, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. Again, that same, uh, the same concepts that we talked about with Pairview Catalyst apply here. Initialize, here's some data, finalize, and, oh, there's the uh, initial, there's the, um, the session file, and visit, they're called session files. You, you create the session file with the external GUI that says, here's the camera, here's the method I'm going to run, here's the ISO level, uh, et cetera. Okay, so those are the apps with in situ APIs. Now I'm going to shift gear and talk about the I.O. library that lets you do in situ. So uh, probably the, the clear winner here, uh, or the, the clear um, name that's known the best, I guess, not necessarily the winner, is uh, ADIOS, which stands for Adaptable I.O. System. And this is from our colleagues at uh, Oak Ridge Lab. And basically, it's an I.O. library that lets you insert um, uh, user code into the I.O. path. 
to perform certain types of computations. Um, so they've done some interesting work where um, between the simulation and adios and um, the consumer, it might be a disk, it might be some, might be your code that you're going to use for an analysis. There's a bunch of different ways to get data from one to the other. So they have a solution that, that is basically memory to memory copies. It uses sockets. Uh, there's a paper coming out in a couple of months that shows using burst buffers uh, with HDF5 is actually faster <laughs> than using the socket based thing. In both cases, neither of them ever hit the disk. So it's the, it's the same idea. So uh, FlexPath lets you do that. Uh, data spaces is this interesting um, uh, subscriber publisher kind of model. So there's been a bunch of research in, in the area of moving data from one place to another. And the Audios folks have done a wonderful job uh, in that space. So one of the concerns that they talk about is um, you know, one of confidence by the science code team. So if a science code, if somebody, if, if you're a science code team person, right, you're running code, uh, and you connect to, to you know, John's analysis method, and you know, heaven forbid, you know, has a seg fault or throws an exception or something, no, of course not. If something bad happens, um, and what's going to happen to your code? Your code's been running for five days. Is it going to take out your code? Is it going to wipe it out? Are you going to, I mean, what's going to happen? Right. Well, you probably have a checkpoint restart file from you know, some time in the past. So maybe all is not lost. But you know, to avoid these dire consequences, if you use a service-oriented approach, then that insulates um, the simulation from bad things that can happen uh, elsewhere. You know, that's a valid concern. OK, so visit um, and peer view are applications that have APIs for doing in situ. Adios and HDF5, which I have not talked about are I.O. libraries that let you inject your code in the I.O. path. OK, so uh, there's another way to do this, too, and that's um, with what's called cooperative multitasking. So remember uh, the Plato slide, necessity is the mother invention. He, you know, Plato probably didn't say that, but that sounds good. Um, a few years ago, one of my colleagues was faced with an issue where on the Cray system at NERSC, he had an A dot out and a B dot out both of which are MPI-based codes, and he wants to uh, you know, share data between them with a, a shared memory pointer. Well, the OS would not let you run a, you know, two different MPI executables on the same node. Wouldn't let you do it. And so he figured out this weird sort of you know, DLL acrobatics where you know, he could make it happen, and out of that came Henson. So the idea basically is that you can have two uh, applications, have them run on the same node, and just hand pointers back and forth between one another. So that's one um, thing that it can do. A second thing that it can do is that it has this really interesting sort of scripting language that control all of this stuff. So think for a second. Think, think about the context for this. So everything that I've talked about so far assumes sort of this you know, static pipeline of producer and consumer. Right? You, you set up the pipeline and then it runs. But what if you want something that's iterative? What if you want some conditionals in this execution? What if you want finer grain control of how this operates? Ah, well, that's, that's where Henson really shines. So I'll show you an example. So um, are, you, are you all ready for code? OK, here it comes. OK, so here's, here's, a, here's a simulation example. So um, you know, I'm inside this red box, simulation time step, this is where you know, all the beauty of scientific you know, Simulation happens, right? I'm whitewashing all of that. OK, thank you for indulging me. After that, um, you're saying, OK, I'm going to save an array. And in this case, it's a, it's a bunch of particle-based data. So uh, we're saving the x, y, and z positions of these particles. So this is a non-interleaved array. Um, this simulation is a, a pick based code. And so we're, we're saving particle positions. And then uh, inside the simulation, um, we're saying yield. OK, so think for a second. Let's map this onto the design pattern that we've been working with. Open, write, close. You know, this is sort of the, the write data phase, sort of, mostly, but with some extra stuff. OK, so to drive this point home, let's look at it from the other end. So here's the consumer, uh, the, the analysis. So we're first going to ingest some data. So we're going to load a, load a double and then load some arrays. And then we're going to do some analysis. Uh, you know, all of science is in this little red box. 
and then, oh, the analysis produces some results we're going to do something with. Um, we're going to um, output that data, and then we yield. Okay, so the simulation does some stuff, and then it yields. And then the producer, or the consumer, does, you know, ingests some data, it does some stuff, and then it yields. What's this all about? Well, um, let me show you. So here's a script. This, this is the script that was used to uh, produce the, the scientific result in this publication. So I'll walk you through this. So Henson, why Henson? Because there are these puppets, and the puppets are the things that you know, do stuff, right? That's, that's where this idea came from. And so you probably can't read this. So in this case, the simulation is this, uh, is this code called Gadget. It does, uh, uh, it's from cosmology, it models um, energy distribution through the universe. Uh, test computes a, a 3D Voronoi tessellation of particle-based data. Uh, entropy does an entropy uh, computation, light cone. Uh, I, the idea is what, what these people are, what the cosmologists do is they model the universe and then they um, you, you, can't, you can't view and analyze everything at once, and so what you do is you, uh, you know, take a view out into the universe from some point at some point in time. And so this light cone business is like a clipping operator that, that takes a subset of the universe and gives you a cone. Okay, so those are the puppets. Um, and here's the Henson script. So um, on the producer, producer side, while simulation is still running, you execute the simulation, you execute the light cone to extract the stuff, and then you send the stuff somewhere. And on the uh, receiver side, you know, while receive, you receive the data, you run this tessellation code to do the Voronoi tessellation, and then you compute the entropy on this 3D field. That's it. And so these, these yields that you saw in the code, so when, it, you know, when you get down here to the bottom, you know, that's the yield. So it blocks. Okay, and then the scripting mechanism knows to, you know, go to this other loop and execute this other other loop. So uh, you can uh, here here I'm showing looping constructs, but you can insert conditionals in this as well and do more advanced stuff. So everything that you're familiar with with uh, you know scripting languages, you can do um, here. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so let's see a couple of more comments about Henson. Um, it's flexible module design. This, the scripting language is really powerful. Um, it's being used right now for code coupling uh, operations. So the, the thing I just showed you is basically code coupling. And if you, in fact, if you think about this, all this in situ stuff is code coupling. Okay. Um, and they've, they've got it running at scale at you know, tens of thousands of cores on, on the machine at NERSC. I mean, this is the real deal. Uh, and Dimitri's working on it actively now. So, I mean, if you have an issue, you can connect with it. Okay, so, wow, I got 10 minutes to cover a lot of stuff. Okay, so um, uh, portability in the in-situ interface. There's two issues. Okay, um, th think about this for a second. You are a simulation code developer, and I've just talked about five or six different ways of doing in-situ, and you're probably sitting there going, oh my god, what am I going to do? How do I decide? Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could instrument your code once? and have it work with any of these different infrastructures. That would be pretty cool, right? Well, what are, the, what are the issues? What are the technological issues standing in the way of that happening? Well, first is the API. Whoops, which you can't see. There we go. Sorry, the API. So if you, if you instrument your code to call Audios, it's not going to work with Libsyn. If you instrument your code to you know, use Catalyst, it's not going to work with anything else but Catalyst. So if you could instrument your code to you know, make one call and then have it talk to any of these other things, that, that's really um, the desired outcome. Well, to make that happen, there's this tricky, ugly data model issue. So let's take a simple example. Let's say that you have a, a particle-based code. You're, you're modeling the movement of particles in space. How do you store particle data? Do you store particles as XYZ value, XYZ value, so interleaved? Or do you have an array of X's, an array of Y's, an array of Z's, an array of, I don't know, momentum or something? Um, which is it? Interleaved or non-interleaved? Right? Okay. Um, well, this is, this is the kind of issue that, that has to get resolved. Um, okay, so let's see. I've already talked about that. I've already talked about that. Uh, and so what, what's, the, what's the Sensei interface? Well, so the, you know, again, 
full disclosure, this is the project I run. Um, this, this is a problem that we're, we're trying to solve, and we have solved it within some, uh, some uh, scope of the problem space. So, um, sorry, I'm just sort of repeating myself now. Okay, so on, on the simulation, how do we do this? So on the simulation side, uh, we have what's called a data adapter. There's, a, there's some bridge code. There's, on the receiver side, there's an analysis adapter. Uh, and over here, you know, all sorts of stuff can happen. And so the, I'm trying to remember what's in these slides. Um, if, you, if you do this right, um, you can, you know, daisy chain these things together. So, for example, you can have a simulation that uses maybe, um, you know, adios for some of the uh, in-transit data movement stuff to, that then send, you know, those chunks of data to other tools for further processing. You could take the output of those and send them. So you can see how you can build up these complicated uh, workflows um, to, to do this sort of thing. Sorry, so let's see. Let me just show you an example here. So there's this interesting code called AMRX. It's out of the Exascale Computing Project. It, does, it uses adaptive mesh refinement, uh, and it shows up in a bunch of different science areas from you know, cosmology, uh, laser plasma accelerators, et cetera. And so this example is, um, you know, we've got Sensei integrated as part of the uh, code base there and got it working with, um, you, you know, you can, you can instrument AMRX with, uh, to have it talk to Libsyn or talk to Catalyst and that sort of thing. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. So to give you an idea of how this works, uh, again, so I'm, I'm, I'm repeating uh, a, a concept over and over over several slides so that it sticks in your head. You have uh, a simulation, you have a consumer, you have a bridge between them, you have a little bit of instrumentation code on, on the sender side, uh, some instrumentation code on the receiver side, and in between these two things is a data model. And so there's this mapping problem that happens from the, the sender data model to the bridge data model to the receiver data model. And um, you're probably thinking, gosh, this is a lot of con con conversions and stuff. I'm going to show you a, a slide or two in a little bit that shows you that it's really not as bad as you might think. Okay, so, um, so I don't know if you can read this or not. This is a chunk of uh, XML, and this shows um, using Sensei with LibSim. And so here uh, we're activating uh, uh, LibSim through XML. We've previously created this uh, session file, and we're specifying it here as part of this uh, configuration. And here's an example of having um, IAMR, IAMR, which is one of the AMRX codes, uh, and having it talk to uh, LibSim to produce this movie. Uh, it's, it's modeling Rayleigh-Taylor uh, instability. Let's see. Okay. So now let's look at with the difference with PairView Catalyst. So again, um, the Sensei XML config file specifies Catalyst. We then uh, specify this you know, Python file that contains the settings that we need for doing the viz and Catalyst. And, you know, same code, but using Catalyst to, to do a movie. And so, again, what's happening is IAMR is running. It's connecting with Catalyst on each, you know, ho however frequently it's connecting. And Catalyst, or Libsim, is doing the rendering and producing an image. So that's the uh, work process here. Okay. So, again, what we're, what we're after, one of the objectives for this project is, you know, write once, you instrument your simulation code once and then have it work with a bunch of these other tools. So here's a bunch of tools, right? So there's, I've talked about Visit and Catalyst. Uh, I've talked about Adios. We can interoperate with Adios. We uh, can interoperate with your custom Python-based analysis tools if you want. We had an example last year um, uh, using YT, which is a 3D Viz thing that the uh, um, astrophysics people like. We can interoperate with Ascent and VTKM. Ascent's another uh, in-situ project, uh, et cetera. So this, this stuff actually works. Um, let's see here. I've talked about this a little bit. I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to skip through a bunch of this stuff. Um, bear with me. Okay, so what kind of 
data models does this bridge thing support? This is a good question. So the bridge data model that we're using is uh, from VTK. It's called the VTK data object, which unfolds into a bunch of stuff. So you know, typical structured meshes, unstructured meshes, AMR meshes, multi-block meshes, point clouds, you know, molecular data, et cetera. So um, you know, this all works uh, pretty well. Okay, so if you were holding on to that thought, gosh, this is a lot of moving parts, how much does this cost? That's a good question. I'm going to talk about this uh, right now. So um, we did a study back in uh, a few years ago and had a publication at Supercomputing 16 about this. Um, we, we actually ran it up to a million way parallel uh, on Mira at Argon at the time. Um, and so what we were looking at is, you know, how much is the cost of the in, of the in situ interface? How much overhead does this thing incur to your code? Uh, and then the other is, you know, how, how does the memory footprint change? Um, and so we looked at a couple of different configurations. So let's see. Um, I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff. We had a mini application that we used. It was it uses. Uh, 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 you know, it's an MPI-based thing. You have these oscillators that you place in space, and they ring over time, right? So it's pretty simple. We had a bunch of different configurations. The baseline is where we had this mini app with no Sensei interface, but it makes the mini the mini app makes a subroutine call to the method, right? So that's the baseline. Um, I'm sorry, that's the original. Then the baseline we instrumented with the interface, but didn't actually do anything. And then we had a bunch of uh, configurations where we were we were actually doing some computations. We did a histogram computation, an autocorrelation thing, which is, requires, that's analysis over time. Um, and then you know, a couple of 3D uh, you know, visualization things. So uh, as a Viz person, this is a horrible slide for reasons that I'll quiz John about later and see if John can figure out why this is so crummy. One, one is time, the other is memory footprint. And I know you can't read any of these numbers, so let me just kind of highlight. So blue is uh, uh, original recipe, uh, yellow is the new stuff, okay, in both, in both charts. So at least we got that part right. Um, yeah. So basically, this slide is time, and so really there's no discernible difference in time between um, you know, running this thing, just doing subroutine calls versus doing in situ. Now we're doing in situ, we're not doing in transit. So that's an important thing. Um, and then memory footprint, uh, again, here's the memory footprint profile. This is a weak scaling study, which means that as you add processors, the problem gets bigger, so the memory should go up. This is, this is correct. So uh, memory footprint for original recipe, and then you know, doing the in situ stuff, you know, it's basically no change. Okay, why is that? Well, because we're doing stuff in situ, uh, with 3D structured meshes, right? This is a limited scale study. We're able to do this with zero copies. So there's no c copies of data. There's a little bit of metadata that's copied from one to the other. But other than that, the heavy payload stuff doesn't move. Okay, so this, this proves the viability of the stuff. So I, I got an eye on the time. Um, so the other question that you might want to ask, you might want to think about, was, well, how much does this cost compared to doing something post hoc? You know, we were curious about that too. I mean, we had we had uh, anecdotal evidence, but we wanted to do something a little bit more formal, so we 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 did something more formal. So we did a a, a post hoc study where we ran the simulation at uh, three different concurrencies: eight, twelve, sixty-four hundred, and forty-five k. And then, how do you decide how many uh, analysis ranks to use? Well. Typically, what we use is about one-tenth of the number of ranks for analysis as we use for simulation. Where did that number come from? Ah, I've been doing this for a long time. That's, you know, that's, that's where it came from. Um, and so this, yeah, so we're using one-tenth the number of ranks for or post-processing. And so in this study, the, um, um, the, we, we have a simulation. It writes out data from you know, 45K cores. And then we read back in the, all of that data onto 4,500 cores and do some analysis and then you know, write, out, write out the results. OK, so in terms of the cost of writes, uh, you know, the, the punchline right here is that 45K, um, it takes 905 seconds to write out 12.3 uh, terabytes. And this is actually a pretty respectable rate on Cori at the time, which had like a 200 gigabytes a second uh, I.O. rate. So this is actually pretty good. You know, this is not an I.O. paper, but it's still pretty good. 
Um, so we were pretty happy with that. Now, that, that's just the cost of getting data out. So in the cost of getting data back in, we could break it down into the amount of time to read, which is in blue, the time to process. And so here you can see the autocorrelation is an expensive computation. And then um, in the case, this says right time, right time. This is not simulation right time. This is analysis method right time. And in the case of this pair view slice thing, we're actually writing out an image. Okay. So hold this number in your head. 2,000 seconds. 2,000 seconds. Okay, for in situ, the total time to solution is, you know, 200 seconds. So it's an order of magnitude faster. Now, this table summarizes uh, everything. So the post hoc versus uh, uh, in situ, um, this column shows the cost for the in situ method, you know, 40 seconds for histogram, 225 seconds for autocorrelation, 80 seconds for catalyst slice compared to, you know, 80, 80 seconds versus 1,500 seconds, 200 seconds versus 2,900 seconds, right? So this is, this is huge. You can do a lot more with it. Okay, so I only got time for uh, probably one or two more slides, so let me show you this one. So in terms of, remember I showed you that junk, that junk example at the beginning? I took the temperatures and I picked a couple of points and I fit a you know, lunk that was junk. Okay, so th this is a real example. So. Uh, we, we worked with a plasma accelerator modeling team. They were running their code in 2D because they were I.O. constrained. They're unable to do output of their 3D code at the resolution that they wanted. And it has to do with a combination of, um, you know, the I.O. strategy they were using combined with this translation from, uh, you know, lab frame to I.O. frame, right? There's this translation thing that happens that gets really expensive. So um, getting involved with them, we were able to help them produce and look at uh, results from the 3D code for the first time. And this example compares the difference. So the bottom is the 2D code, the top's the 3D code. And I'm taking you know, a slice out of the 3D code and, and comparing them. And so you, you, know, you can't read this. It says proton. This is proton average. It's energy. It's the amount of energy that's generated by this a uh, plasma wake that's used to accelerate particles in a, a compact accelerator. And just this difference in energy levels at this point in time, you know, the, the, the science code team guys, they were really excited about this. This was a breakthrough for them. It told them that their 2D model, you know, it was useful, but it was unrealistic. It wasn't until they got to 3D modeling that, um, you know, interesting things uh, began to happen, and they could corroborate this uh, through experiment. Um, okay, so let me skip through some stuff. Uh, what's coming in the future? I've talked a bit about code coupling. You know, everybody, everybody wants to do code coupling. This is happening a lot in ECP. I've talked to, you know, Bill Collins and Mike Wiener. They're interested in doing this sort of thing. Everybody's interested in code coupling. So, um, you know, this may be a viable path forward. Now, there's some issues with code coupling. So if you have, um, you know, different assumptions about the physics of each code, you may have to do you know, more work than just connecting the plumbing from one to the other. You have to make, do some uh, numerical work to um, uh, resolve the differences that this kind of stuff can't resolve for you. It, it just creates the plumbing for you. Um, I'm hoping that we will begin to see more collections of software that uh, make it easier for you, the, the you know, science code consumer, to actually go pick the stuff up and use it. Um, we are doing uh, and have been doing tutorials at SC every year. Um, the Ascent people have been doing them. We, we're actually doing a, a tutorial joint with them this year at SC. We did a tutorial at ISC. I mean, there, there's, I, I run a workshop every year at SC on, on this stuff. Um, please come. It's called ISAF. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, again, um, you know, this is, this is the main message. Uh, nothing new here. Um, you know, it, other than, to, you know, let me reiterate, it's worth your effort to look into this. Um, I want to acknowledge my funding sources. Thank you, DOE, for paying for this work. Uh, thank you the, for the uh, use of the computing centers. Uh, I have a list of further reading, and with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much.